morning. Welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Michael Talercio, pastoral intern of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. Glad you can join us today as we look at 2 Kings chapter 3 for day number 485. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we look at his word and ask for his help. Father, thank you that you have given us another day in which we can hear from you and we can read the rich history of your people uh, and especially your work in this world in and through your people. We pray that as we look at this passage today of 2 Kings 3, that by your grace you would allow us to understand what it is communicating to us, uh, how it's pointing us forward to your son, and how it might impact how we live our lives here in this day and age. We pray that Jesus would get praise from this uh, time, from the way that we are affected by this word. And we pray it in his name. Amen. All right, we're looking at 2 Kings 3. In the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria and he reigned twelve years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, though not like his father and mother, for he put away the pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from it. Now Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he had to deliver to the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram marched out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. And he went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to battle against Moab? And he said, I will go. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Then he said, By which way shall we march? Jehoram answered, By the way of the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And when they had made a circuitous march of seven days, there was no water for the army or for the animals that followed them. Then the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has called these three kings to give, to, to give them into the hand of Moab. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Then one of the king of Israel's servants answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and to the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, it is the Lord who has called these to the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. For thus says the Lord, that stream bed shall be filled with water, so that you shall drink, you, your livestock, and your animals. This is a light thing in the hand of the Lord. He will also give the Moabites into your hand, and you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree and stop up all springs of water, and ruin every good piece of land with stones. The next morning, about the time of offering the sacrifice, behold, water came from the direction of Edom, till the country was filled with water. When all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to put on armor from the youngest to the oldest were called out and were drawn up at the border. And when they, when they rose early in the morning and the sun shone on the water, the Moabites saw the water opposite them as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings have surely fought together and struck one another down. Now then, Moab, to the spoil. And when they came to the camp of Israel... 
the Israelites rose and struck the Moabites till they fled before them. And they went forward, striking the Moabites as they went. And they overthrew the cities, and on every good piece of land every man threw a stone until it was covered. They stopped every spring of water and felled all the good trees till only its stones were left in Kir Hariseth, and the slings, slingers surrounded and attacked it. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against him, he took with him seven hundred swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there came great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. One of the things that we read of in today's passage is that there's an alliance formed between the king of Israel, Jehoram, and the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And it's an interesting alliance because it's actually the second time that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, has formed an alliance with a king of Israel. In fact, Jehoshaphat had already allied himself with Jehoram's father, Ahab. And in that battle, back in chapter 22 of 1 Kings, in that battle that Jehoshaphat allied himself with Ahab for, Jehoshaphat was kind of left out to dry. Uh, Je uh, Jehoshaphat had decided to help Ahab to go to war uh, with the king of Syria and it led to Ahab disguising himself in battle such that it seemed like only Jehoshaphat was the king and the king that the king of Syria was actually going after. So Jehoshaphat had already gotten himself into some trouble by allying himself with Jehoram's father, and yet he's doing it again here in this passage. Nevertheless, Jehoshaphat is regarded well uh, by Elisha in the passage, as we saw, and as such, he is uh, understood to be a, a king that worships Yahweh, a faithful king in Judah. Jehoram is not, and that's one of the reasons why his name is very seldom even used in the passage. He's talked about as the king of Israel. Uh, and Elisha makes it clear that if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, he wouldn't even really be speaking to Jehoram, the king of Israel, wouldn't be helping him. Um, but, but God is gracious to Jehoshaphat, and so as a result, by extension, he's gracious to not only Jehoram, but even the king of Edom, who is allied with these kings as they go to war uh, with the king of Moab, because the king of Moab has decided to stop paying uh, taxes, uh, we might say, to uh, Jehoram after the death of his father Ahab. And so we have these three kings going to war with the king of Moab, again, who has stopped paying this tax. And what's interesting is that all three of these kings seem to, seem to be in trouble. That There is this lack of water. There's this drought, it seems. Uh, and so notice how uh, the two kings um, respond to this drought. The first one, the king of Israel, Jehoram, seems to blame God, does he not? Verse 10, the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. So, despite the fact that we, we don't get any real clear word from the Lord in this passage for these men, for these kings to go to war with Moab, the king of Moab, for him no longer paying this tax. Even though we don't get any clear word in the, the text that it's the Lord's will, what we do get is a complaint from the king of Israel against the Lord, saying, ah, the Lord has gathered us together, even though, again, it was the king of Israel's decision to do this on, on his own, it seems. The Lord has gathered us together is the complaint from him uh, to, to give us into the, the hand of the king of Moab. And yet Jehoshaphat, in contrast, says, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? So Jehoshaphat, again, we see his uh, willingness to trust the Lord, to turn to the Lord by, by turning to the Lord's servant Elisha, the prophet of the Lord here. We see his willingness to trust the Lord 
despite the fact that the, the king of Israel, Jeh Jehoram, does not want to. Or another interesting thing uh, is just in how God blesses these people, how he blesses the kings of Israel and Judah, uh, because we, we kind of, uh, we get a bit of a mistranslation here uh, in the ESV, um, where after uh, Elisha hears the music uh, of this music maker here, and uh, he's stirred up to to make this uh, statement, uh, we get it as a prophecy in the ESV. Um, verse 16, after the hand of the Lord comes upon Elisha, he says, thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. That's how the ESV translates this, this verse. But if we were to look at the KJV, I think it's a bit more faithful of a translation from, from what I understand of the Hebrew, uh, which actually says, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. See, in the KJV, it's actually a command from the Lord through Elisha to these kings and their men to make this valley full of ditches. For the Lord, as, as the prophecy or as the command in more specifically continues, though it is a prophecy. Um, for, verse 17, thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind or rain, but that stream bed shall be filled with water so that you shall drink. So there's water that's going to come for these men who are experiencing this drought. Uh, the, and it's, it's going to come into the valley. And the thing is, is the water would just go right through the valley. I mean, if you can picture a valley, uh, this valley is not going to be uh, a, a giant pool of water. Rather, at, and that doesn't really even make sense when you think about it. Water is just going to go right through. But if, as the KJV says, if the kings of Israel and Judah and um Edom here, if they have their men dig ditches, then as the water flows through the valley, some of it's going to remain in the ditches. And the thing that makes more sense if we understand it in this respect, that it's a command for these kings to trust God by actually digging into the ground. There's, there's trust that's involved here. Then the water will look more like in, in these little ditches, it'll look like blood. I mean, it, would, it, would, it really, would it really make sense for these kings to think, for, you know, for these men of Moab to think that that entire valley, if it were filled with water, were blood? I mean, who could produce that much blood? It would be insane. It would be terrifying to think that there was that much blood that they would think that a valley full of water were actually blood. Um, that, that just wouldn't happen. But if they were these little ditches that were filled with water with the sun shining on them, then it, then it would look like there was actually a battle that had taken place and there were these puddles of blood kind of scattered throughout. But in any case, what's important is that we see that the very means whereby God blesses his people, provides water for Jehoshaphat and those with him. That, that very means is what God uses to bring about the destruction of their enemies, of the enemies of Jehoshaphat and those with him. God uses both. Uh, he uses water to bless his people and he uses that water to seem like blood to bring about the destruction of the enemies of his people. And that, that's what God does. He blesses his people. And the means of blessing is the means of destroying those who don't love the Lord and who are the enemies of his people. We got a, the clearest picture of that on the cross where Jesus was punished in place of all of God's people. Jesus was beaten. He was tortured. He was destroyed. He was crushed, as it says in the scripture. He was crushed on our behalf, on behalf uh, by the Father, on behalf of the, the people of God. But if you recall back to the book of Genesis, what when was the word crushed used early on in the Bible? But in the prophecy that God gave 
such that he would send an offspring from the woman, from the seed of the woman, to crush the head of the serpent, to crush the serpent's offspring. So the same means of blessing God's people, Jesus being crushed on the cross, would be the means whereby God crushed the devil, crushed Satan. Satan no longer has a hold over God's people. But it is also the foretelling of the destruction of all of those who will not turn to Jesus and have his blood cover their sins. It is what is pending for all of those who would die apart from Christ. It is a a foreshadowing of the destruction that comes to those who are the seed of the serpent and who won't turn to Jesus. It's a, it's a sobering picture. And what, what is really disturbing, actually, is the picture that we find at the end of the passage today in 2 Kings 3. This, this is what it looks like at heart uh, to refuse Jesus, to refuse God's grace. It looks like being willing to do whatever it takes to hold on to our independence, because that's what the king of Moab is doing at the end of the passage. He is unwilling to yield to the king of Israel to go back to paying taxes. He's unwilling to yield, and so what he does is he takes his own son, the one who would be most dear to him, and he offers him up for a burnt offering on the wall so that everybody could see. This is this man's protest. This is, this is the cost of his defiance against the king of Israel, that he would kill the one who should be nearest to his heart so as to declare, so as to proclaim, so as to show forth his independence, his unwillingness to bend the knee to the king of Israel, to the, the people of God, as it were. That's what it looks like to refuse God's grace. And brothers and sisters in Christ, may God protect us from sacrificing people, from sacrificing even just good things in order to defy God, in order to claim our independence, in order to feel like we're in control of our lives. May God protect us from sacrificing good things for something that only brings about destruction, especially when it involves people. May God protect us. Let's go to him now in prayer and ask for his continued protection, that we would press deeper into the salvation he has provided in Christ, and that we would live in light of it so as to live opposite of this king of Moab from today's passage. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us Jesus, not just an offer, but an actual, uh, the one who secures salvation for all of your own, Lord. Thank you that we get a a reminder in today's passage, Lord, in in this chapter, uh, that you bless those who uh, stand with your son. But Lord, what we really need is to turn to your son, because we could be in the community at large and still miss out on the true blessing. We could be like the king of Moab in our hearts, Lord, and really be willing to sacrifice anything for the sake of our own uh, independence from you. And, and really, it just it is evil and it leads to destruction. You, you will take care of all of that in your timing, Lord. A submission to you. And we pray that we as your church um, would, would welcome people now into the uh, opportunity to be in fellowship with you through the gospel for Jesus' glory and for our good. In his name we pray. Amen. I hope that will have blessed you today, this look at 2 Kings 3. Until next time, be well, brothers and sisters.